to The Kohava Show. I am your hostess, Kohava Latham. You, the viewers, can contact us by sending your emails to kohavashow at yahoo.com. Once again, thank you for allowing us into your presence. Here is our debate topic. Should near-death experience be accepted as extracorporeal manifestations of human consciousness, what logical impact should both afterlife and near-death experience have on our philosophical world view? The debate topic is a viewpoint favored by Dr. William Guy. Dr. Guy, please explain the topic. Well, basically, um, what it's asking is the question, is consciousness, our awareness, the thing that we identify as self, is that just due to neuronal interaction, a collection of 100 billion neurons in our head uh, alone, and the interaction between those neurons? Or is there something more to it? Uh, is consciousness also uh, a, a product of a spirit, um, an other self, something that is able to travel outside of the body, independent of the body, and is able to perceive from a vantage point distinct from the body. In general, that's basically what that's asking. And what is your position on the topic? Human consciousness is dualist, that while our brains are functioning normally, um, there's, it's very difficult to distinguish between what we call spirit and what we call uh, the brain. They're the same. The mind and the spirit are one. However, when the organic brain is suitably compromised, there is evidence that I'll present here that consciousness is able to leave that body and be elsewhere, have a, a, di a different vantage point than the eyeballs in the head, is able to see uh, and perceive not only reality here on earth, but hereafter, if you will. The contrast topic is the opposing viewpoint by Dr. Palavalli. The conscious aware self is established by structures and processes of the nervous system. When the structures, cells, and other tissues become destroyed and those processes cease, is there nothing else to establish the conscious aware self? Quote unquote, human life becomes once more as before birth, non-existent. Dr. Palavalli, please elaborate on the contrast topic. Yeah, well, Thank consciousness, uh, <coughs> the way the neurosciences describe and define is simply as awareness of ourselves as well as our surroundings and the interaction of those two. So you have to be awake to be conscious um, and how it perceives our body image as well as how that body image is interacting with the rest of the uh, uh, stimuli that are coming, coming from the surrounding environment. So this is purely because of the way our brains are structured and their function. So at any given moment for us to be conscious, many areas of the brain are working through what's called parallel processing. So when they are disturbed, then there is no consciousness. So as far as uh, this existing before birth and after death, uh, it doesn't exist because mind and consciousness are what brain does. So when the brain is not working, it's, it doesn't work. It's like heartbeat is not going to exist when the heart doesn't work. In the same way, consciousness doesn't ex exist independently. So before birth, we have a sperm, we have an ovum, and there's no person, and there's no consciousness. And then they unite, they divide, they start forming the uh, embryo, which has, until the nervous system develops to a certain extent, doesn't have consciousness as we define it, because there's no nervous system developed yet. And once that is developed, there is a little bit of consciousness pertaining to only to the extent that brain has developed. So as we're uh, born and growing older, our consciousness is dependent on how complex our brain is. And after death, this parallel processing function of brain stops. So the function doesn't exist. It's the function uh, that we call as consciousness. So there is no existence of consciousness independent of brain. And explain your position. Consciousness does not exist before, that, before birth or after death, independent of a working brain. Thank you both for stating your positions on both the debate topic and the contrast topic. Here is our first question. What is the nature of soul with regards to thoughts and actions in afterlife? 
And this question is posed by Dr. Pallavalli to Dr. Guy. Dr. Pallavalli, please expound on the question and Dr. Guy, uh, follow with your answer. There's no verifiable definition of soul or spirit. It's supposed to be uh, invisible. Uh, it can be felt, it can be smelled, it can be heard, and it can be photographed. So my position is it doesn't exist. So when people say, soul leaves the body after death and goes to heaven, I want to know exactly the nature of it. Well, does it have a brain? Does it have arms, legs? Does it wear the same clothes when, she was, when uh, the person died? When a person dies at 90 with cancer, is the soul at that level of the mental state or is it at the level of a young person? And when it goes into afterlife, exactly what's the function of that? Does it get up in the morning or is there a day and night? So these are all absolutely very, very important and interesting questions when it comes to soul, uh, people claim, claiming that soul and spirit leave the body and go to afterlife. And I'm thinking, okay, what is the nature and what do they do every day or every year or every millennium, whatever the time frame is in afterlife? That was my question. Thank you. Dr. Guy. In terms of the nature of the soul, I mean, this is not something that we can put under a microscope or deduce from a biochemical perspective. Uh, we, don't, we don't have that ability and we have to be honest up front and say this is not something that we can submit to empirical, invest empirical investigation as easily as we can trying to discover uh, what is near thermal vents on the bottom of the ocean floor. We can, send, we can send machines down there to take samples and we can bring them back up and study them. This is not, this is not like that. Uh, the evidence that we have to look at has to do with people's experiences. We have a lot of them, and I think it's the sheer number of near-death experiences that are out there that are so, that are so interesting and so amazing. Um, just to kind of congeal that, we'll can try to put that together, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this later. But to define this soul or spirit, my definition would be that aspect of consciousness, well, it's not mine, actually, this is from a textbook, but <laughs> that aspect of consciousness that subjects identify as themselves, that is able to dissociate from the body with suitable cerebral compromise and witness and or experience events and persons outside of the confines of their body, even at distances remote from bodily sensory awareness. Now, when they come out, uh, in terms of the makeup, the makeup, again, is not available to us. We don't know what they're made out of. Uh, we can't see them. They report that they can see us. They report that they can observe medical personnel, they, that they can observe family and describe details. We can't see them. Nobody's ever seen them as far as I know. However, the 10 elements that make up the near-death experience are awareness of being dead, uh, about 50% uh, are become aware of that positive emotion, extreme euphoria beyond anything they've experienced before. Even if they've used really good drugs, the euphoria that they experience is beyond any of that. Uh, the out-of-body experience, seeing their bodies on the ground, moving through a tunnel, communication with the light, the ob observation of colors never experienced before, the observation of a celestial landscape. Uh, it's usually, it's very natural. Even people from the city report seeing very green grass and flowers and trees and, 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 and experience and, and sensations that are beyond what they've ever experienced in their normal everyday experience. Then there's meeting with deceased persons, quite a number of people experience that, and the life review, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, and then of course the presence of a border for many people. They come to a fence or a river or some type of barrier, and they know intuitively that if they cross that barrier, that's it. They, they are going over to the other side and there's no return. And uh, these, are, these are the common elements, the common experiences that people have. Now beyond this, Beyond these, yes, there are some nuances and some, 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 but most of the things, most of their experiences fit into this category. Beyond that, we can't say. We cannot launch an exhaustive investigation into what goes on uh, with these individuals. This is a very, very important uh, uh, point where we have to really understand what Dr. Guy just said. He said it's a consciousness that is capable of living outside of body when suitable near-death experience happens. Well, I mentioned that consciousness, by definition, is a function of the brain first. So there itself, uh, it doesn't quite fit with the, uh, with the uh, discussion. The second thing is, near death, his position is that there are a lot of people who have these experiences, so there's something to it. Near-death experiences are real, but all the elements of near-death experiences were not understood by people 
who were our ancestors. You know, you have Tibetan Book of Dead, you have Egyptian Book of Dead. They had no understanding of what the mechanisms behind this were. So they came up with elements called soul and spirit and extracorporeal consciousness because they had no understanding of it. But in 21st century, every element that Dr. Uh, uh, Guy mentioned are being explained through neurosciences and new knowledge that is uh, uh, being conducted almost every year. Dr. Guy, this is your question to uh, Dr. Palavali. Can you find the text of any actual studies proving that people with frontal lobe hypoxia, that's deprivation of oxygen, commonly become completely insensitive to pain? Quote, as must be the case if their experiences are organic, since 100% of ND ears report no pain when they are observing bodies from what they feel is the ceiling. Again, this is a question to you, Dr. Palavali. Okay. Well, uh, I don't think there, is, uh, there was any statement ever that they are completely insensitive to pain. I did look at uh, the uh, quotation from one of the books that Dr. Guy uh, came up, the, uh, the, for, for which the, the answer, uh, the question uh, uh, came from. It's from uh, a book called uh, Mortal Minds by uh, an anesthesiologist by name G.M. Orley. And in that, he didn't say that they become insensitive. He said they become indifferent. There is a difference. So Dr. Guy Bean, a psychiatrist, very well knows that, for example, if we take pain, there is what's called somatic pain, and then, which means the actual pain that we feel as pain, right. and then the affective response to the pain. That means how we respond to that pain. So for example, uh, he knows that when people are depressed, their pain gets magnified. In other words, they don't feel pain to the same severity if they were not depressed. So their affective re reaction is different. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, so in this case, when there's frontal lobe syndromes, there's injury or uh, there's hypoxia uh, or uh, bleeding or in brain surgery, actually, we see a lot of patients with what's called meningiomas that are tumors that are in the front that cause pressure and gradually they notice that they don't take care of themselves, they don't take care of their checkbook, they become indifferent because they don't care about it. So the question was, are they insensitive to pain? No, that was never mentioned in textbooks that they're going to be insensitive to pain. Yes, he did. He talked about the anhedonia. He talked about the fact that they become less caring. Uh, that is true, uh, they, especially about social things. These yeah. people will relieve themselves in public. They will say things that are inappropriate. Yeah. They have no concern for other people. Okay, they, 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 they give in to their organic desires when people have frontal lobe damage. I've treated hundreds if not thousands of people with dementia, for example, that takes the frontal lobes, and this is what we see. Um, he did actually say there was complete insensitivity pain as the explanation for when they perceive that they're out of their bodies and they look at themselves, oftentimes with limbs hanging, with chest cavity open, with gaping wounds, mm -hmm. and they're manipulating them, they feel nothing. When they put the, the paddles and they jump, they observe it from the outside and they, they report that they feel nothing. And so his explanation was, well, because of frontal lobe hypoxia, well, they're, 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 it's, it, it shuts down your ability to experience pain. The problem I have with that is that if they're experiencing detailed auditory phenomena, that means their auditory cortex and the auditory association cortex and the thalamus have to be receiving sufficient blood so that they've got enough electricity for these to work. And, and what, what the other side's explanation often is, is that while they're overhearing these things and they're creating a movie, they're creating uh, a hallucination based on what they're hearing. But if that part of their brain is working, then why isn't the frontal lobe working well enough to experience pain?